All right, well, this evening we're going to finish off chapter 13 of Luke's Gospel. And I think I've already given you a little bit of a preview, although this text also contains other things that aren't necessarily related to what I've been talking about, but are building up to it. And so we'll want to look at that and also uh, make some application from that as well. So let me read the text and you'll see what I'm talking about as soon as I, as I read it, and then we'll look at it. Beginning then in verse 31 of Luke chapter 13. Just at that time, some Pharisees approached, saying to him, Go away, leave here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I reach my goal. Nevertheless, I must journey on today and tomorrow and the next day, for it cannot be that a prophet would perish outside of Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not have it. Behold, your house is left to you desolate, and I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, may the, the Lord help us to understand this passage this evening and, and to be able to apply it. Well, again, this morning, remember we saw that um, as Jesus was continuing on his journey to Jerusalem, this time to lay down his life. He was redeeming the time along the way, buying it up and using it for his Father's glory by teaching in the cities and villages. And again, the importance of redeeming the time. On the way, someone asked him a very important question, are there just a few who are being saved? Now, we, we saw this morning, and again, this really dovetails into what we're looking at this evening. As a Jew, this man believed, because he had been taught his whole life, that all he needed to enter into God's kingdom was to be one of Abraham's children, to be circumcised. But from what Jesus was teaching, it didn't appear, uh, it certainly didn't sound like he agreed with it. So instead of answering the question that he asks on account of Jesus' teaching, he answered one that was more important. How is one saved? And remember, Jesus said it's not by being related to Abraham. It's not by circumcision. Uh, just as we are not saved by baptism, we're not saved by church membership. We are saved only by believing in the Lord Jesus. But again, the point we saw this morning is uh, we, uh, you know, that we're saved by a faith that produces striving. Remember, the striving to enter into the kingdom of heaven, which is really sanctification. Another way of saying that this faith will not be a bare faith, it will produce works. It will be a faith that causes us to grow into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ and to do His, His work and His will. Entering the kingdom, Jesus told us, requires a great deal of effort. I mean, not only must we overcome our sins and our hatred of Jesus, because that's the way we come into the world, that we might trust Him, because we're not inclined to do so as we come into the world. We also need to die to ourselves. Remember what Jesus said, we cannot come after Him unless we're willing to pick up our crosses and follow Him. So we must be willing to follow him even if it means that he leads us to our deaths. That certainly was the case with the disciples in those days. Now, this is not something we can do in our own strength, obviously. It's something that God must do by his Holy Spirit. And so Jesus was telling them, you need to come to me to enter the kingdom, but you need my spirit in order to enter the kingdom, in order to have this kind of striving to put forth this kind of effort that is required. So again... I want to remind you, we're not saved by striving, but the fact that we're saved is evidenced by the fact that we are striving. And then finally, Jesus warned them about the need to begin to strive into the kingdom immediately if they haven't already started. The door of mercy is open only for so long, and once it closes, uh, it's not going to open again. And remember, it closes, it can close, because... We, if we're outside of the kingdom and we resist the Lord too much, he can hand us over. There is a point of no return, but it certainly closes at death. So if we don't know him, we need to come to him uh, immediately. Okay. Now, the next thing Luke tells us is 
something we, we wouldn't expect to see, and it should, should have surprised us as I was reading this, that there were some Pharisees who approached Jesus with a warning, you need to get out of here because Herod wants to kill you. Now, this evening, what we want to look at is this, whether or not this was a genuine warning. Were these Pharisees actually sincere? We want to see Jesus' response to the warning, and then we want to see how his response essentially shows his love for his unrepentant people, even for Israel. Okay. So first of all, let's consider whether this warning was a genuine warning. Again, Luke writes in verse 31, just at that time, some Pharisees approached, saying to him, go away, leave here, for Herod wants to kill you. Now, I've already said, you know, doesn't this strike you as, as something strange? Because how often do we see Pharisees expressing concern about Jesus' well-being? It seems like they'd be more uh, apt to say, you know, if Herod had actually said that, let's don't tell Jesus about it. Maybe he'll get caught and Herod will, will kill him. Now, why would the Pharisees want, you know, basically, um, uh, why would the Pharisees uh, not want to express, you know, let's say, a concern for Jesus' well-being? Well, let's think about all the times that Jesus has actually stepped on their feet. Remember, Jesus was the one who was threatening their relationship with Rome. If, if the Jews accepted him as the Messiah... The Romans would come in and take away their power, take away their country, take away their influence. They hated Jesus. And let's not forget that some of the things that Jesus had to say about the Pharisees. Remember, it was just, I think, in the same chapter that Jesus went to the, to the synagogue on a Sabbath where he healed a woman who had been, been bent over double for 18 years. Remember that uh, what, what Jesus said to the spiritual leaders, among them Pharisees, when they objected that this should not be done on the Sabbath. Jesus said, you would do this for your animals. I mean, you would do this for your dog, essentially, but you won't do it for this woman. And they were humiliated. So the question is, having basically Jesus telling them the truth continually, were they now helping him by warning him about Herod's threat? Now, it is possible, it is possible that they were. Because there were some Pharisees who believed. You know, as I looked at the Bible, I, I could only, only find one that seemed genuinely to believe, but there were others who seemed to believe and yet were running into difficulties, like at the Acts 15 Council, where um, they were saying, the Pharisees who believed were saying that you need to instruct these new believers to be circumcised and observe the law of Moses. They were Judaizers, and Judaizers are not Christians. But there were some who did believe. Nicodemus was certainly among them. He's the one who helped Joseph of Arimathea. Remember, prepare the body of Jesus for burial after his crucifixion and put him into Joseph's tomb. Maybe these Pharisees were among those who actually believed. I believe Nicodemus also talked about some who believed. And the threat that they were bringing to him certainly appears to be a legitimate threat. Now, this Herod is not the Herod that wanted to kill Jesus as a baby. You know, he's, he's gone by this time. But this Herod was the son of that Herod. This is the Herod who beheaded John. This is the Herod who thought that Jesus was John, okay, who had been raised from the dead, and that's why miraculous powers were at work in him. Now, Jesus had also been making public statements about John the Baptist. Remember that he was the greatest prophet that God had ever raised up. Now, what would Herod think about that? Okay, well, this greatest prophet was the one who is telling me that I'm in adultery and that I need to repent. So by saying that John is so great a prophet, he was validating John's charges against Herod, that he was an adulterer for taking his brother's wife. Maybe he really did want to kill Jesus. But it's also possible that the Pharisees said this, simply to frighten him into leaving Galilee, that Herod really wasn't out to get him. Now, why, why would I say that? Well, we are going to see in Luke's gospel, although it's several chapters away, it's really only a few days away. Remember, Jesus tells us in this text that he had to travel today, tomorrow, and the third day he reaches his destination, which is Jerusalem. Well, we're going to see that, that uh, Herod is also going to be in Jerusalem at that same time, 
where when Pilate sends Jesus to Herod, he's going to express delight in actually being able to see Jesus for the first time. We read in Luke 23, verse 8, Now Herod was very glad when he saw Jesus, for he had wanted to see him for a long time because he had been hearing about him and was hoping to see some sign performed by him. This doesn't sound like a description of a man who probably about a week earlier was out to kill Jesus. So the question is, why did these Pharisees want to drive Jesus out of Galilee into Judea, into Jerusalem? Well, it's because, as we see, the Jews there were the ones who had the authority to kill him. Now, secondly, we see Jesus' response to this warning of the Jews. He tells these Pharisees to go and tell Herod, if in fact Herod was the one who, told, who said this. And Jesus, of course, would know that, although we're not told explicitly in the text. If Herod was in fact behind this, that he's not afraid to go to Jerusalem. He says in verses 32 and 33, Go and tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons, and perform curses to, or cures, excuse me, cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I reach my goal. Nevertheless, I must journey on today and tomorrow and the next day, for it cannot be that a prophet would perish outside of Jerusalem. Say, Jesus needed to go to Jerusalem. Now, if it was the plan of these Jews to scare Jesus into leaving Galilee and to drive him into Judea, they must have been delighted by what Jesus just told them because they wanted him to go to Jerusalem to die. And he tells them that he's going to Jerusalem in three days where he expects to do just that. Jesus knew the Jews in Jerusalem wanted to kill him, wanted to put him to death. We read in John's gospel. By the way, it's interesting how the gospels have different emphases, but John's gospel gives us more about the interaction between Jesus and the Jews in Judea and Jerusalem than the other Gospels. And this is what we read in John's Gospel in John 7, verse 1. After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. And even though that was the case, Jesus still very faithfully went up to the feasts. He was still in Jerusalem. But the point is, Jesus wasn't afraid. He wasn't afraid of death. Now, the reason he came into the world, we know, was to die, to sacrifice his life, to sacrifice himself so that his people, so that we might actually live. Jesus was prepared for this. Jesus often thought about this. He spoke to his disciples about it, especially as the time was drawing near. We read in Matthew 17, verses 22 and 23, and while they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were deeply grieved. But Jesus wasn't afraid. Again, this was his mission. This is why he came into the world. He knew that his life was in the Father's hands. He knew that by giving his life, he would save his people. And he knew that this was the way that he would be ushered to his throne in glory. Jesus had a right perspective on death. He often thought about it. He often communed with death. It was basically something, again, that was a doorway for him to a greater glory. Now, our tendency today, I think, is to push death as far out of sight as we possibly can so that we don't have to think about the fact that one day we're actually going to have to face it that we're actually going to have to go through it. I think when we're younger, I think young people in particular have a difficult time thinking about dying. And the reason is because they're still so entrenched in this world, still holding on to the world. They're, they're not ready to leave this world. They don't see the value of that world which is to come. As we get older, I think it becomes a little bit easier because we know we can't hold on to this world. Sometimes we deceive ourselves into thinking when we're younger that we actually can't. But if we would think more about death, and if we would think more about what Paul said about death, which is to depart and to be with Christ is very much better than remaining here, than anything we might possibly have here, we might be less afraid of death. 
we might actually look forward to death as our Lord Jesus. It might also free us up to live life with the kind of courage that we see in the Lord Jesus. Why was he able to live the way that he lived? Because he trusted his Father and he was not afraid of death. You see, we can have that same confidence, right? In the Lord Jesus Christ, death is but a door that brings us into heaven. Now, Jesus said that he needed to go up to the holy city. He needed to go to Jerusalem because, he says in verse 33, it cannot be that a prophet would perish outside of Jerusalem. What does he mean by that? Were all the prophets killed in Jerusalem? Not necessarily. But in those days, if a true prophet was going to be put to death, he first of all had to be declared a false prophet. I should say any prophet, really had to be declared a false prophet, and that could only be done under the authority of the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin sat really only in this city. So if Jesus was going to die at the hands of his people, it had to be in Jerusalem. Well, finally, let's consider how his willingness to do this really shows his love for his unrepentant people. Now, as Jesus considers the fact that his own people were going to condemn him and hand him over to the Romans for execution, it it elicits an emotional response on his part. It almost appears to break his heart. He cries out in verse 34, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not have it. Now, let's, let's look at a few things regarding this, this statement. First of all, uh, I think you'll notice that these are really the same words that our Lord will say when he is in Jerusalem, during the last week before his crucifixion, during, basically, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, the Passover, just after he pronounces the eight woes on the Pharisees. In other words, it, it, it's in Matthew's gospel, it's in a different place. Now, it's possible that Luke moved his statement here because it better fits his theme, or it's also possible that Jesus said this twice, but I just wanted you to recognize in case you notice that this may have, you know, at least in Matthew's gospel, appears to take place at a different time that you're aware of that. And then I want you to notice, secondly, to whom Jesus is speaking. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He is speaking to all the Jews and particularly to the leaders of the Jews who reside in Jerusalem and who have the authority to put the prophets to death. Now listen to, listen to what Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown write in their commentary. He says, they say, Jerusalem here does not mean the mere city or its inhabitants, nor is it to be viewed merely as the metropolis of the nation but as the center of their religious life, the city of their solemnities, whither the tribes went up to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. Now, this next statement uh, takes into account that this was taking place during the Feast of Passover. And at this moment, it was full of them. It is the whole family of God then which is here apostrophized, I think that's the only time I've ever seen this word, or at least accented, by a name dear to every Jew, recalling to him all that was distinctive and precious in his religion. So Jesus' lament, his heart is breaking over the whole Jewish community represented by Jerusalem and the fact that he says it twice, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, is just emphasizing his lamentation over them. But again, notice who it is he's lamenting over, a people that has killed the prophets. He says in verse 34, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. This doesn't sound like he's lamenting over the righteous uh, Jerusalem, but rather over the unrighteous Jerusalem. Now, this, this, what he describes here is, is essentially what he's going to illustrate later in the parable of the vineyard, remember? And this is when he's in Jerusalem and he's debating with the Jewish leaders, with the Pharisees and the scribes. He says, there was a landowner, God, who planted a vineyard, which is essentially Israel. He rented it out to vine growers who were the religious leaders of Israel and went on his journey. Uh, 
and how when it was harvest time, he sent his servants, the prophets, to the vine growers to receive the produce of the vineyard and how they beat one and killed another and stoned a third and how he sent more to them and they did the same to them and finally how he sent his son, his only son, and how when they saw him, they said, this is the heir, let's kill him and the vineyard will belong to us. This is the people that Jesus is lamenting over. A wicked people, especially their leaders. And yet, fourth notice, Jesus' heart towards them, his desire towards them, which, again, is, is a difficult thing to understand, particularly in light of their wickedness, although a wonderful example of how our Lord Jesus tells us that we are to love our enemies. He says in Luke 13, verse 34, how often I wanted to gather your children together, just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. Now, he says, how often I wanted to do this. Uh, the commentators believe that he's not referring just to the six or seven times that he had visited Jerusalem during the time of his ministry, but the many other times that Jesus had come to them through the prophets that he had sent. How many times I've come to you and have wanted to gather you together, he said to myself. Remember, this Israel, this, these Jews, these people, were his people. We reflected on that this morning. They were his old covenant bride. They were the bride of Jehovah or, or Yahweh of, of, of the, the covenant God of Israel. He cared about them. He cherished them. He wanted to guide and, and protect them, as he says, as a hen guards her chicks. But each time he came to them with his offers of mercy, they would have nothing to do with him. And yet, he continues to love them even though they were rebellious. I think that's very interesting. And I do believe that this is a love that is different and greater than the love and commitment that God has toward those who aren't in covenant with him, such as the, the nations surrounding them, such as Rome uh, in those days. But there is one other thing that Jesus talks about in this lamentation, and that is that that love will eventually come to an end, as we saw this morning, if they don't enter the kingdom while the door is open, the door will be closed against them. And Jesus is warning them that that door is closing, that day is coming. He says, behold, your house is left to you desolate. And I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And by the way, he's not, he's not saying here, especially because these words are repeated in Matthew's gospel after he comes into Jerusalem because these are the very words that were actually quoted when he rides into Jerusalem. He doesn't mean you're not going to see me until I ride into Jerusalem. But what he means here is that, um, first of all, that he's going to reject them. 70 AD was coming. Your house is going to be left desolate. And though they might continue to look for the Messiah whom they believe was going to deliver them from Rome, that he was still coming to deliver them even from the Roman invasion that was coming in 70 AD, they would not see him again until in his mercy he would turn them to himself. By the way, this is one of the passages that um, the Puritans used or at least saw in, in this a future revival among the nation of Israel uh, as a possibility. But notice those who have the greatest blessings which the Jews certainly did in God's plan, also have the greatest responsibility to live up to those blessings, to live up to those privileges. And when they do not live up to those privileges, as the Israel did not, there are greater consequences, right? How often I came to you and wanted to gather you, but you'd have nothing to do with me. So now your house is being left desolate. With greater privilege comes greater responsibility and greater consequences for rejecting those, those overtures of mercy and of grace. Now, let's move from here to, to application. Now, we could certainly apply this to believers, right, that uh, the Lord is patient with us, that he loves us even when we do not love him as we should. That's certainly true, by the way. But we do need to recognize that there isn't really an exact parallel between, between us as believers and these Jews that he's speaking about who were his covenant people and yet were wicked, the ones who had, again, killed the prophets and were actually going to put him 
to death. The Jews that are in view here are certainly unconverted. They did not trust in the Lord. And even though God was patient with them, we, we read Jesus is telling them that his patience is going to run out. Now, God's patience is not going to run out with us by his grace and his mercy. He will bring us to heaven if we have trusted in his son. That is a done deal, and we need to believe that. So there isn't a one-to-one parallel between us and the Jews in this circumstance, but there is a parallel to another group of people, I think, and maybe we should apply that to them, to those who are in a parallel relationship with God, a relationship like these Jews. Now, what is that relationship? Why was God so patient with them? Why did he come so many times with so many overtures of mercy? Why was Jesus expressing this love for them? It wasn't because they believed. And it also wasn't because they just happened to be human beings. It was because of whose family that they were actually in, right? It's because they were a part of Abraham's family. Remember what the Lord said in Genesis 17, verse 7. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. That's the relationship that God had with his people Israel. That's the relationship that Jesus had with these people. And notice that it's called here an everlasting covenant. And I think it's interesting because we actually do see this covenant continue, this relationship continue, even into the new covenant, and even towards the people who are not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. His love towards them continues. I believe Peter spoke about it on the day of Pentecost when he said with regard to the promise of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.38. For the, now he's speaking to the Jews here, and he's certainly speaking to the Jews who believe, but he says, for the promise is for you, you who believe. But he also says it's for your children. Now that's interesting. Not, not that their children are saved necessarily, but the promised Holy Spirit is promised to them. And then he goes on to say, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Now you, as I've said, refers to the Jews. Your children refers to their offspring because the promise basically was given to them. The promise applied to them, to the Jews and to their children. And then he adds, those who are far off or the Gentiles, since the Lord was about to call them also to himself through the gospel, and give them the Holy Spirit. I think we see the first example with Cornelius and his household, right? But the point is God's promise still applied. It was still made to the Jews even though they rejected the gospel. Now, let me give you an example of that. As a matter of fact, the meditation that we read this evening is, says essentially this in Romans 11, 28 and 29. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. What does he mean by that? Well, you're trusting in Christ. They hate Christ and they crucified Christ. And now that you're following Christ, they want to kill you too. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are your enemies. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the Father's. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. You notice that while they're enemies to the disciples, at the same time, they're beloved by God for the sake of the fathers. Not because, obviously, not because they believe, because they didn't believe, but because of the relationship, the relationship they had with the fathers. Because God said, I would be a God to you and to your children for an everlasting covenant. He even, Paul, even expresses his desire that that these who basically are in covenant with God would uh, come to him even if he should have to perish in order for that to happen. Now that, I think, is the ultimate expression of love. I think it's interesting that in Jonathan Edwards' day, there were many who believed that the ultimate way to glorify God, the, the, the apex of our love for God would be our willingness to be damned for his glory. 
Well, that's essentially what Paul is saying here, but we need to remember that could never happen. It's, ex it's basically Paul's expressing his heart for his people, Israel, that they might be saved. Listen to what he says in Romans 9, verses 3 through 5. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom, by the way, notice the present tense in each of these statements, to whom belongs the adoption as sons, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the temple service, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and from whom is the Christ, according to the flesh, who is over all, God blessed forever. Now, Paul is saying this in the new covenant dispensation. This is after Jesus has come and completed his work. The new covenant is in force, and yet he is saying these things still belong to them, and because they are so privileged in God's plan, and he cares about them so deeply, he would give up his own salvation to see them come to faith in Christ. In the gospel dispensation, they still basically had a relationship with God. Okay, that, that's the point. God's promise to them still, still held, even though they rejected Jesus. The promises still belonged to them, and the Lord was still reaching out to them consequently in his mercy. Now, I think what I'm about to say would be something that both, um, you know, uh, Pado baptists and Baptists could agree on, because we're not really talking about the issue of baptism right now. We're going to lay that on the table. But the question of whether or not we can actually apply this, the same kind of love and care and relationship that God had towards the children of Abraham, towards our children. Because if we can, it gives us, I think, at least an additional layer and level of, uh, of, well, of confidence that perhaps in the Lord's mercy, he will bring them uh, to himself. We need to ask the question, what about the children of believers today? What about our children? Who haven't believed. If the new covenant is really the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, which it is, right? Uh, Paul makes many references to the fact Abraham believed, we believe, we like Isaac are children of promise because we believe and, and so forth, how basically the promises made to Abraham of the seed that for whom all the nations would be blessed, that's Jesus. And we are the nations who are blessed in this and how we were formerly far off and have been brought near and now are fellow citizens with the saints and partakers of the same covenants as they are. You see, basically, God has not put his covenant with Israel aside and then started something new with the Gentiles. He's brought the Gentiles in to what it is that he had promised to Israel. And now we are a part with them. We are a part of essentially the, the covenant that he had made with them in its fulfillment. Now, if that's true, there's really no reason to believe that God is no longer concerned about the children of those who are in covenant with him. Now, we understand that doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to be saved, right? How many children did Abraham have that did not believe and subsequently were destroyed? We were reminded this morning of that very fact, and as, as Paul reminds us in, in the book of Romans, though the children of Israel be as the sand of the seashore, it's only the remnant that's going to be saved. Doesn't mean they're going to be saved, but it does mean that the Lord continues to care about them and to reach out to them, even when they don't believe in him, as he's reaching out to Israel and as he came to them many, many times, seeking to bring them to repentance because they were his people. Now, it is true in the end that having these privileges could mean that they're going to be worse off because, as we already saw, with greater blessing comes greater responsibility. But what a blessing to know that there's more going on to bring our children to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ than just our efforts. I mean, our Lord, I believe, is still working in their lives, and I think he's working in a way that, um, he, that isn't necessarily true of children in unbelieving households. God is working in their lives. I, I think if you just step back and take a look, sometimes you can see the gracious things that he is doing, and he is working for their good, 
to lead them to himself. So I think with that in mind, we, we do need to pray that God would work and that God would, in his mercy, graciously reach out to them and that he would bring them all to himself. So God has an interest. God still cares. Uh, and God may have a wonderful plan for them. Remember what, we, um, what I made a mention of just a little bit earlier where the Lord talks about um, in, in the commandments how he will visit the iniquity of the, of, of the fathers uh, upon their children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate him. But he shows loving kindness to thousands of generations to those who love him and who keep his commandments. Well, that, that describes a believer, right? A believer is one who loves him and who keeps his commandments. The Lord says he will show mercy even to a thousand generations. It doesn't mean that everyone in those generations is going to be saved. If that were the case, the whole human race would be saved because Adam and Eve believed. But it does mean that some of them will experience God's mercy and grace. Some cases, all of our children. In some cases, relatively few of our children. It could possibly even skip over a generation. But God is at work. And I think that that is a, a wonderful comfort. So we do need to pray in light of that, that God would bring them uh, to faith in himself. Well, let's, um, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's, let's ask the Lord to apply this and help us to apply it for comfort.